So just to uh, highlight that uh, Mayo Clinic does receive research funding from these companies, uh, which co constitutes a conflict of interest. So I wanted to take a few minutes to talk a little bit and build on what Margaret shared with us earlier this morning about the rationale for why we would want to use immune checkpoint inhibition in Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And then just talk a little bit about why do they work? I guess the second question is probably the more important one is how well do they work? Because we've seen some great data and you probably are aware of it and I'll discuss this and that's in Hodgkin lymphoma. They certainly have had a higher response rate, but what about other lymphomas? And then the key question thereafter is, well, where are we going to use them? And is there merit in using them alone? And if we're considering using them in combination, where would we use them in combination? <clears throat> so really just to start us off, the key thing that we would like to see when we're treating patients is to have a powerful immune response directed against the tumor, as highlighted by that green arrow. However, the biggest challenge is just there are many things that are inhibiting that immune response. And uh, multiple cells are present in the immune microenvironment who are, whose mission it is, is to shut that immune system down. So firstly, the malignant cell is actually the problem. And as you heard very elegantly this morning, you can get upregulation of a variety of different ligands. And these ligands are directly suppressive on this infector cell to decrease its ability to target the, immune, the, the tumor cell. But there are other cells present in the microenvironment who also are shutting down this effective immune response. So shown here are macrophages, dendritic cells, monocytes, and these cells can express ligands, which either directly suppress the malignant cell, or the, the, the uh, T cell, or alternatively induce regulatory T cells whose job it is to further suppress the immune uh, response. And as shown here, the regulatory cell can secrete all kinds of cytokines and have direct interaction with T effector cells to shut down the immune response. Furthermore, there are myeloid-derived suppressor cells who, again, have a direct effect on the cytotoxic T cell to shut down this effective response. So all told, there are multiple immunological barriers to an effective immune response. So the questions are, how can we use an immune checkpoint approach to try and modulate this and improve the outcome. So you saw a similar slide earlier, but I think it bears repeating just so that we can remember exactly how we might do things. So shown right in the middle here is the T cell receptor engaging an antigen on a MHC class one or class two molecule. As shown over here, you can see a variety of different ways in which the immune system could be dampened. So what you're seeing are a variety of receptor ligand interactions, and these interactions would switch off the immune response. In contrast, across this side here are a variety of different messages which would actually activate the immune system. So how could we kind of modulate that balance? How could we get less suppression and more activation? And I would tell you that, as I'll show you in a minute, this is a hot area where multiple molecules are coming out looking to try and tip the balance in a favorable direction. So I wanted to start off talking about two things. Again, many in the room would be familiar with these, but highlight that specifically in the context of Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. First being PD-1, second being CTLA-4. So the question is, how exactly does this work? Well, as you can see, here is a tumor cell expressing the ligands, as you heard before, PD-L1 and PD-L2 interacts with PD-1 on an effector cell and effectively shuts it down. If you block that interaction, you would keep the cell in an activated state. CTLA-4, kind of over time we've learned a little bit more, but it might have a more of an indirect effect. By blocking that, you're actually affecting regulatory T cells, and regulatory T cells then make less of their suppressive um, uh, molecules, and by doing that, liberate the T cell to be more effective in targeting the tumor. So does it work? So firstly, just focusing on CTLA-4. CTLA-4 has obviously been well known in uh, solid tumors, melanoma, renal cell, other kinds of cancers. Does it work in lymphoma? So there's been a small study that we did of 18 patients looking at ipilimumab uh, as the primary therapy for patients with lymphoma. And we did see responses. In fact, there were two patients who benefited. Here is a patient with follicular lymphoma. You may see some lymph nodes in the back of the abdomen. Partial response, which lasted about 19 months. Here's a patient, and this may be a little hard to see, with biopsy-proven large cell lymphoma with a liver lesion. 
That patient actually went into remission and is actually seven years out, still in remission. Many patients could actually be shown to have an immune response, but it's interesting, the immune response doesn't always correlate directly with the clinical responses. So I think we've still got a lot to learn about what is really a biomarker of efficacy. This has been used in a variety of different settings. This is ip ipilimumab, the CTLA-4 inhibitor. This is a trial of patients that were treated post allotransplant. And in fact, if you look at the uh, subset of patients who benefited, most of them were either Hodgkin lymphoma or mantle cell lymphoma. I think what's curious, and again, as we learn about how to use this agent, in this study, none of the patients had worsening of their GVHD with the use of ipilimumab. So maybe if the, the uh, effector cells are not actually going after anything, by taking off that uh, break, it may not actually target self-antigens. So secondly, how does it work if you target PD-1? So again, you heard a little bit about this this morning. Here again is your tumor cell expressing many of these ligands. Here is the effector T cell. And by blocking the negative regulators, this cell remains activated and is able to target the tumor cell. Does this work? So there have been a number of antibodies that target PD-1. And the first was an antibody called pedalizumab. This was first used in autologous transplanted patients, post-transplant, really kind of looking to modulate the immune system after doing a stem cell transplant. And the goal in this study was to have a progression-free survival at 16 months of 70%. And the primary goal was reached in that 72% of the patients were still in remission. I think what is really interesting is they focused in on the subset of patients that were high risk. Those patients clearly seemed to benefit. And I think what was most interesting is when they focused in on 35 of the patients who actually still had residual disease and said, did they respond with the use of pedalizumab? There was a 51% response rate in the patients uh, that actually had active disease. Further study has been done in combination with rituximab. So this is pedalizumab plus rituximab in refractory and relapsed follicular lymphoma patients. Uh, 32 patients with a 66% response rate. You might say, well, who cares? That's not that great. But I think what was pretty impressive is a 52% CR rate. And most of you who treat patients with rituximab would know that that's quite surprising, suggesting that there may be additional benefit for the use of PD-1 blockade in this subset of patients. So a second antibody targeting PD-1 is nivolumab. And again, many of those in the room are aware of some of this data, but I'll walk you through uh, the initial clinical trial. It was a dose escalation uh, part of the study. It was subsequently a dose expansion part. I'll highlight the Hodgkin data and then the T cell and B cell subsets of the study with the endpoints of response and durability of response, as I'll show you in a minute. I think what is important, and Margaret touched on this uh, when she discussed some of this earlier, is that uh, the side effects were, ex as expected, were mainly immune-mediated, not as dramatic as has been seen with other agents like ipilimumab, and very similar to what has been seen in solid tumor studies. This just shows you the best overall response rate, and you can see, and what I'd like to highlight here is that we have a lot to understand about why patients benefit and who exactly benefits, because the response rates are quite different by histology. So follicular lymphoma and large cell lymphoma patients, about 40% of the patients treated, although I would stress these are small numbers, had a response to therapy. T cell lymphomas were substantially less, about 20% of patients, and multiple myeloma at the original report, and subsequently there's been one, one response, had no responses, predominantly stable disease. Many of you will know that additional data is coming out utilizing uh, Revlimid and uh, dexamethasone in combination with PD-1 blockade with significantly more responses seen. Hodgkin lymphoma, however, was completely different, and you heard a very nice uh, discussion this morning about why that may be. But there's nothing more gratifying than a waterfall plot where all of the water hangs down, uh, and you actually have responses seen in virtually every patient, but I think you can actually see clinical benefit in every single patient. And as Margaret mentioned earlier, the responses have been durable. Many of these patients now out approaching two years and still a majority of patients continuing to benefit. As you saw before, uh, in the 10 patients in whom there was tissue available for an assessment of PDL1 and PDL2, 
It, there was overexpression in all cases, and in all cases, this was genetically driven. Similar data was seen with the third antibody, pembrolizumab. So this was also presented at the ASH meeting last year, and in this uh, 29 uh, patient cohort, again, the vast majority of patients benefited from therapy. Similarly, the duration of response was uh, very uh, satisfactory, and patients continue to benefit uh, from this treatment. And the side effect profile was well tolerated and very similar to seeing what was seen with nivolumab and very similar to what is being seen in other solid tumor studies. And equally interesting was again overexpression of PDL1 as a primary finding in 10 patients who were part of this study. Interesting is when we contrast the effic efficacy in Hodgkin lymphoma with how other patients with other histologies, including B-cell lymphomas and T-cell lymphomas do. Running out of juice here. <clears throat> um, but I think what's important to notice is the mustard color is uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and you can almost see there are two populations of patients. A group where it just goes straight on up, which would suggest that these patients don't benefit at all, and a subsequent group where patients appear to benefit, some of whom can subsequently progress, but there have been patients who have continued to benefit. Follicular lymphoma patients, there are responses seen as well, and some of those also appear to be durable. The T-cell lymphoma data also shows that there are differences in responses. Some patients who clearly don't benefit, patients who benefit, and it, it's a mild benefit, but it appears to be somewhat durable, and some patients who have a clear measurable disease response. So that's how you might benefit from an immune checkpoint inhibitor that actually inhibits the negative signals. Is there a way in which we could go after the positive signals and actually activate the T cells and potentially get a benefit that way? So briefly, I just want to highlight two, and that is targeting CD27 and targeting CD40. So this is a phase one trial of 24 patients treated with an anti-CD27 antibody. This is virilumab, CDX1127. And again, in, in uh, lymphoma patients in general, not quite as the same success story, activation seen of immune uh, responses, but responses only seen in one patient, and interestingly, again, in Hodgkin lymphoma. Similarly, with the CD40-directed therapy, uh, 50 patients treated in this trial. Majority of patients tolerated the treatment well, but again, the response rate was disappointingly low, and although there was benefit in about a third of patients, the subsequent phase two trial did not want to take this study, uh, this agent forward for further uh, study. There are other antibodies now being developed in this space, hopefully to be more effective and potentially uh, create by greater benefit. So although there is efficacy, there are differences between which uh, immune checkpoint or which immune agonistic uh, therapy you use. So coming to the uh, really the million dollar question, and that is how are we going to use this as we move to the future and as we think about how we can optimize treatment for patients. So right now, the way I see it, there are actually three main approaches to how we treat patients. We either directly go after the malignant cell, or we give a therapy that is directly cytotoxic or, uh, or toxic directly to the malignant cell. I would call that a depletion approach. There's a second way in which you're trying to inhibit critical pathways that the uh, malignant cell is dependent upon, <clears throat> starving them, if you like. And I'd call that kind of an inhibition approach. The third way is kind of what we've been talking about to, uh, so far, and that is, can you activate the immune system and thereby create a greater benefit for patients, a kind of an immune approach? But I would put to you that probably our best strategy is to use all three in a, what I might call a reprogramming approach. Because unless you kind of target each one of these areas, the likelihood is that the other sides of the three-legged stool will kind of just take over. So how might we really use immune checkpoint blockade in the context of those three approaches? So how can you make the depletion approach better if you use an immune checkpoint therapy? So firstly, you've heard a lot about chemotherapies and where we might use it, but I would say that as we use an immune checkpoint inhibitor with chemotherapy, the key question is going to be, do we need to use it at the same time, or should we use it before, or should we use it after, because when you directly toxically uh, 
target cells, you're going to get some collateral damage where you will kill off some of the uh, good immune cells at the same time. Well, maybe you can be a little bit more targeted. So possibly we could use brentuximab vedotin as an example, where we would directly target the malignant cell, but use it in combination with PD-1 blockade and create a greater effect that way. There are actually a number of trials that are looking at that. There is a study in second line for patients with Hodgkin lymphoma, and there's an upfront study for elderly patients using brentuximab and nivolumab. And thirdly, possibly we could build on the experience with pitalizumab and use an immune checkpoint after a more intensive approach, just as we heard in the debate, as patients are recovering from an autologous transplant, optimize the immune system by directing T cells that are effective against the malignant cell to target that cell. Second thing is how can we maybe take the immune uh, ch checkpoint blockade and optimize some of the pathway-specific therapies? It's really interesting that if one looks at how some of these agents work, they have profound effects on the immune system. So HDAC inhibitors can upregulate PD-1, for example. So could you use an HDAC inhibitor in the context of PD-1 blockade and increase PD-1 expression, but thereby blocking that and optimizing those T cells? Abrutinib and adilolisib are known to have T cell functions. In fact, um, abrutinib targets ITK as well as BTK, takes cells from a TH2 approach, makes them more into a TH1 type cell. So could we, and again, there are a number of studies using a BTK inhibitor in combination with PD-1 blockade. And thirdly, downstream of signaling with, with, through PD-1 and uh, is the many of the uh, path, pathways, including uh, mTOR and PI3 kinase. There are a variety of different uh, molecules that we have used already that target that, and could we use those in combination? And finally, and some folks asked these questions a little earlier in the day, and so I'd like to just touch on that. How can we take the immune uh, approach and optimize that with the immune checkpoint blockade? So the first question is, could you just have more immune checkpoints and add, uh, inhibitors and add them together? So clearly you could target PD-1 and pd one as was asked in the question. But also you could use other immune checkpoints, including CTLA-4, antibodies to LAG-3, antibodies to TIM-3. And those trials are actually underway at present. There are a number of trials using PD-1 blockade in the context, uh, in addition to CTLA-4 blockade. That's all on one side, as it were, on the inhibitory side uh, of the uh, immune uh, teeter totter. I guess the second question is, could you block something on both sides? So could you block the inhibitory uh, message, and could you actually give an activating message? And so there are a number of trials using CD27 in combination with PD-1, or using 41BB in combination with PD-1, or OX40. So again, I think these are things that are going to be coming in the future, combining two approaches, activation and inhibition. And finally, what you could say is, well, could you take a way in which you could activate the immune system and further augment it with the use of an immune checkpoint inhibitor? So many in the room would be pretty familiar with CAR T cells, biospecific antibodies, some of the bite molecules, even viral therapies or vaccines. All of these can be augmented when you activate the immune system and then inhibit the negative regulatory effects. So as I end, I'd just like to say that this is an encouraging, exciting time for immune checkpoint therapy. This is an encouraging and exciting time for immune therapies in general. I think this really is the new frontier in uh, lymphomas. I think it holds real promise, even as a single agent, but also in combinations, particularly in Hodgkin lymphoma, but in non-Hodgkin lymphoma too. And because we have multiple agents, this is going to be a very exciting time to work out how to best put them together. I guess the biggest challenge is that we actually work out how to put them together in a way that benefits their effects rather than contradicts each other and creates an antagonistic effect. So with that, I'll end, and thank you very much for your time.